All right, we are now starting Genesis 32. Uh, last time when we left off, we had uh, Jacob had just finished leaving um, the land of Laban. So if we have our little map here, I'm going to make this a little small, you can see it. Uh, if you remember, we started off, his story started in, um, I believe, in Beersheba. And mm -hmm. then he, when his brother Esau wants to kill him, and, and why does Esau want to kill him? Or I shouldn't say, he didn't. He doesn't want to kill him right now. He's going to wait till his father dies, and then he's going to kill him. But why does he want to do that? He took his birthright. His birthright, yeah. His inheritance. Traded it for stew. He sold him his birthright, uh, but that wasn't the, um, the the kicker, though. That was the start of it. But what was the, the finishing touch that put it over the edge? Was it the blessings? Yes, yes. He, uh, he took the blessing. Um, that was rightfully his now. Um, but he, uh, Isaac intended to bless Esau and Jacob deceives him and he is deceived into doing the right thing, which is blessing Jacob. And uh, Esau is just feels cheated and disgusted by this. And so he's determined to kill him. Rebecca finds out and um, convinces Isaac that uh, Jacob needs to go find a wife now. And let's uh, he ends up sending him to Haran back to his family over there. And so we first left Beersheba, and then he went to Bethel. What happened at Bethel? Do you remember? The uh, the uh, ladder or the stairway uh, encounter with, with God. Yeah, it's there that God encounters, comes to, to Jacob, with the, the stairway to heaven with the angels ascending and descending, mm -hmm. and then God making a promise to him that... Uh, the promise he gave to Abraham, I'll multiply your descendants, I will bring you back to this land. And he calls it Bethel, which means, anyone remember what that means, Bethel? It, Beth means house in Hebrew, and El. House of God. House of God, <laughs> yeah. Bethlehem, Lehem means bread, Bethlehem means house of bread. Um, so when you see Beth, that's house, and El and even in names today, like if you see a lot of names that end with E-L, Michael, Daniel, Nathaniel, there's all sorts of names that end in E-L, mm. that L is God. That's what that means. And, and oh. something about God. So Daniel means God is my judge. Uh, Michael means who is like God. So you have different, uh, uh, different phrases. So he leaves Bethel and he heads up to Padanaram. And, and how long is he in total if you remember how long does he stay up here remember how many years that was 20 20 20 years that's correct uh he he worked seven years as a single man and then uh he gets leah he's tricked again like like isaac they're just deceived into doing the right thing he gets <laughs> tricked into marrying leah she's the one whom god has chosen for him, but uh, he doesn't want Leah. He wants the pretty one. He wants Rachel. Rachel. Just, like, just like Isaac doesn't want to bless Jacob. He wants to bless Esau, the, the kid who can cook. That's the one he wants. who can make the meat he loves. Um, same thing here. It's just his appetite's leading him, but in a sense, Laban deceives him into doing the right thing, which is marrying Leah. Uh, and then he does give him Rachel, but in exchange for Rachel, what, what does he have to do? Seven That's more years. Working. Seven. seven more years. So he works seven years, marries Leah, and then he waits a week and he marries Rachel in exchange for working another seven years. So 14 years. And then finally he works 14 years and then he ends up working another six years. And during that time is where he gains his flocks and his herds and his wealth comes in that six years. Once he has paid off his debt of, of his two brides now he so he's 14 years for his family and now six more years for his possession so 20 years and it's time to go it's time to get out of there um how would you describe laban's relationship to jacob at this point um what are your thoughts on that i think he's trying to get everything out of jacob that he can you know <laughs> yeah yeah he's uh he seems to be a schemer he seems he's constantly changing his wages and uh, if God wasn't on his side, Jacob says, "You would have, I would have been sent away empty-handed. I would have been done for." Uh, but mm -hmm. God 
just used everything, whatever, whatever Laban said was going to be the wage, God made it work out in Jacob's favor. So he leaves there, he crosses there, and Laban then chases after him. Um, and we head down to Gilead. And if you remember what happened, this is the last chapter. What happened in Gilead? Um, Laban catches up with him. And he's not yeah. happy. Yeah. No, he had a dream, or God spoke to him, where he said, uh, back off if you intend to do damage to Jacob. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember what, what really put Laban over the edge that really made him? He was stealing his gods. Yes. Yes. Who stole the gods? His daughter. Rachel. Yes. It was Rachel who stole these household gods. And we're not told why. We had some theories about that. But Laban is a pagan man and he is worshiping other gods and he is using divination uh, and that you would use those kind of household gods to do divination. So it's it's possible that Rachel steals them simply so that to hinder her father from being able to do divination and to know which way they're going. I don't I don't know that it would have been out of greed or um, it doesn't really say her motives, but that's one possible which, which made sense to me. But we're not we're not told her motives, but that she did it. And but the point of that passage is not why she did it, but the fact that these gods are, are worthless. That they're, they're what kind of gods get stolen? You know, if that, that's not a very powerful God you're worshiping if you can steal him, if he can be mm -hmm. stolen. And not only that, but be sat upon by a woman who's in her cycle at this point, just the indignity of it all. Uh, I mean, these gods like, no. So this is the shame of it. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Lord is exerting his sovereignty over all, all these situations. So that's where we left off last time. Now... We're moving on. He's heading back, and he's going from Gilead here now to Mahanaim. He's, he's, he comes to peace with Jacob because of the Lord's intervention, because the Lord basically tells him, you better not touch this man. He, he comes to fear the Lord, and he enters into a covenant with Jacob, kisses his family, and goes home in peace. So that's settled. Wonderful to have peace there. Jacob never has to worry about Laban again. But he does have one more problem as he's heading back to the promised land. Uh, there's one more loose end that needs to be tied up. And who is that? Esau. Esau. Yeah, he's got to mm. deal with Esau. So let's pick it up. Uh, chapter 32. Um, let's start there. Uh, Elizabeth, would you start us off here? I'm going to... Sure. Uh, Whoops. Uh, one to five. Let's start there. Ah. Hold on a second. Okay. There you go. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God, God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Mahanaim. And Jacob sent messages before him to Esau, his brother in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may that I may find favor in your sight. All right. So we start with the very interesting thing here, verse 1. So Jacob leaves Gilead, and what happens on the way here? Angels of God, man. Yeah, Jacob meets the angels of god huh that's interesting that's all it says yeah i wish they elaborated a little bit on that <laughs> that's all it says so it's it, it's it's you can see the the parallel can you uh, we this has happened before hasn't it mm -hmm. on his way up there he met he saw the angels walking up and down the staircase yeah mm -hmm. when he when he left home that was the first thing he he goes and in bethel he encounters the, the angels of God. Um, and so we're reminded of that scene. So it was here. Let me get our picture here. So here in, uh, it was in Bethel that he encountered the angels of God. Now across the Jordan over here as he's coming back. So just as, as, a, as he's about to leave the promised land, he encounters the angels of God. And here, as he's about to enter the promised land, 
he encounters the angels of God again. It's almost like there's like the guardians in a sense of the land. It's very, very interesting as he has to sort of pass through these checkpoints. Uh, so there's some spiritual things going on we don't know about. Um, so we'll just say, all we can say is that it's similar to, uh, to Bethel when he was leaving uh, the promised land. We'll call it the land of Canaan for now, but this is, yeah, the promised land. This is the land that God promised him. So there are just these spiritual activities going on, and that's all we're told. We'd have no idea what he saw. What Was it another staircase? What was going on there? Um, who knows? Uh, but Jacob's conclusion is, uh, what does he say? When, when he sees them, what does he say? This is God's camp. Yeah, this is God's camp. And he calls the name of the place Mahanaim. You know what Mahanaim means? You have notes on that? I have a reference. Um, looks like Joshua <laughs> twenty one thirty eight was the reference I see here. I've got double double camp. Yeah, yeah. Mahanaim means two camps. Uh, why does he call it two camps? Is that where he's going to meet Esau? Uh, no, no. Um, I'm I mean, cheating, he, but my note says one being God and one being his. Yes, yes. Jacob's camp and God's camp. Hmm. So <laughs> this, God is here. Just like before, it was Bethel is the house of God. This is the house of God. And now he's this sort of the camp of God as he's traveling with him now. Um, he's sort of seeing... It's it's kind of like the what Elisha saw. Do you remember that when uh, the story of Elisha in the in the, in the Bible, where uh, this great army is coming to capture him, and Elisha is standing on a hill with his servant, and he's at perfect peace, and his servant's freaking out, and yeah. and the, the yeah. army's coming, and and yeah. uh, praise God, open his eyes, yeah. and he opens his eyes, and, and what does he see? Yeah, he sees uh, the mountain is full of uh, fire, fiery horses and chariots, and that uh, second king six. Fire. He sees the spiritual forces at work, the armies at work, and and uh, and so he's God is there, even though he's the only human being there. It's like the angels of God are all there, uh, ready to go. And uh, Elisha at that point then blinds the entire army with a word and uh, leads them into the presence of their their enemies. It's it's a fascinating story, but you you it's a glimpse of what's really going on behind the scenes. God is with him in this. That's something important to get because I think we get discouraged sometimes. Uh, we feel like very alone, like with the, you know, especially in the in the powers of darkness are so great, and the and so many people just hate, hate, hate the church and Christ, and um, you know, you really feel like the people in charge of the world right now hate us. Uh, and so it, it can be very discouraging at that point. However, you, you got to remember, it's like, we're only seeing the physical. Uh, Jacob gets a glimpse into what's going on behind the scenes and God's armies are at work. They are at work. Uh, we cannot see them, but they are working. And uh, here God is camping with him. It's a powerful scene. All right. So Jacob sends, next, next part is that Jacob sends messengers before him to Esau. So in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So when he's coming here, I'm trying to think where, where is, Edom is over here. Mm. So Jacob is uh, coming now. He's Again, he's coming down now. He has got an enormous number of flocks and herds. This is, this would get noticed. He is not coming by himself, sneaking in. He's coming with a whole entourage. He's got a huge family, all kinds of servants, and lots of flocks and herds with him. And he's coming back. So mm. he's, he's again, he's not sneaking in. And you'll notice where he's coming. Here is Edom. This is where Esau moved to after he, at some point in the last 20 years, um, Esau left Isaac and Rebekah and moved to this place across the Jordan to this side of the, the Dead Sea into Edom. And so it's coming right now, moving in toward Esau's territory. 
he is aware of that. So somehow they uh, somehow the folks are kind of aware of each other's what's happening with each other. Um, I'm sure news is traveling. And again, this is it shouldn't be too surprising because this, this is part of the world that everything passed through. People were constantly traveling from Egypt up to Assyria and Babylon, and they would all go this route. They would all go through here. So there's all, all kinds of traffic. So if you wanted to find out about things happening in Egypt or up in Syria, the news would travel. It would get there because people are traveling through. So uh, he knows Esau is there. And so how's Jacob feeling about this? A little nervous. A little nervous, yeah. And so what does he do? He sends messengers and he gets behind the crowd that he's that's going along with him. So he uh, he he's preparing to meet Esau now, his brother. And as far as he knows, Esau is still, you know, wants him dead. Wants him dead. And uh, so let's see what happens here. So he prepares to meet Esau. And so how does he do it? What does he first do? He splits up his camp. So if Esau goes one way, half of the camp will escape the other way. Yeah, I think you're skipping ahead. That's the next paragraph. Okay, sorry. <laughs> first paragraph, that's all right. And this paragraph here, what does he do first? He sends, sends out messengers. messengers. Yeah, he sends messengers uh, before him uh, to the land to the land of Seir, the to the to um, Esau's country. Edom is another name for Esau, if you remember. Remember what Edom means? Red red stuff. Means red. That's right. He was big red. Uh, Esau, I believe, means hairy, and Edom means red. And so he's that was his nickname, Big Red. So he was <laughs> the country he found is called Edom, uh, the Edomite. So he's he sends messengers to that land. Um and um what does he say? What is the message? Your servant. Yep. Your mm -hmm. servant. Jacob, he, he takes the place of his servant. Uh, sojourn with Laban and stayed until now. Um, he offers him donkeys and flocks and oxen and male and female <laughs> servants. A lot flocks, servants, um, all for what purpose? Find favor. Find favor in your sight. To suck up to him so he doesn't get his butt kicked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sitting here thinking, didn't do him a lot of good getting that blessing, did it? <laughs> you know, uh, that's a great question about this. I mean, you 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 see the ways of God in these stories too, don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what does it look like when God loves you? And and it doesn't look like the way we think it does, does it? It's like he puts you through the trials, mm -hmm. such such trials, but he's with you through them and cares for you. And, and it keeps stretching. But look at look at what's happened to Jacob. And what's interesting is how he refers to himself. Uh, Thus, you shall say to my Lord, East, my Lord, Esau, thus says your servant, Jacob. I thought in the blessing that the older was to serve the younger, right? Wasn't that how it was supposed yes. to go? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and Jacob here, even though uh, Jacob is declared by God to be the Lord of Esau. And yet, Jacob uh, presents himself as a servant. I don't know. Does that sound familiar to you guys here at all? Well, Christ presented himself as a servant to, to us. Yeah. Here, here for us. Yeah. Exactly right. It's like this is the things are turned upside down here. Jesus said, you know, I didn't I didn't come to be served. I came to right, serve. serve and to give my life a ransom for many. And, you know, I, your master and Lord, have washed your feet. I have taken the place of the servant. The greatest shall be the least and the uh, will be the servant of all. You can see that Jacob has been changed here. Something's different about him. And he is, um, I think through all these journeys, there's, there's a learning to trust God, a learning 
and a humbling that's happened with him. He's great humbling. I mean, look at what he's been through in his last 20 years. And God brought him through. And now he's coming to this great challenge. And I don't I don't think he's being insincere. I don't think he is um, sucking up um, in that regard. I don't think that he's not being... I, the Bible doesn't have us... If, if it wants us to read it like he doesn't mean it, and he's trying to escape something, it'll tell that to us. Uh, I think we can take him at face value here that he really is in a humbled place here, and he wants peace with his brother. I really think that's the case here. I don't think this is simply, he's scared, rightfully so, absolutely. But I don't think he's just like um, a hypocrite here pretending to be all fine and, and humble. I think he really is. And um, so, because that's been, been the whole process of God, has been humbling him each step of the way, breaking him down. And it's not, it's going to continue in this story too. It's it's a little interesting because he supposedly got the birthrights and 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 the blessing, but Esau still has everything. Because yeah. when he left, he didn't take anything with him. Um, Esau. What's interesting is Esau does not have what God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is this land. He is now his own land. Yeah. But he doesn't have the promised land. Um, so God will certainly that's why it's like, you know, he God's hatred of Esau, God, you know, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, is is not that God is out to get him and destroy him and he just despises him and holds him in contempt, but rather he chose Jacob for a purpose. Um, but Esau, no. Esau will have success, he'll become a kingdom. Of his own um he'll have lots of supplies he's gonna have you're gonna see he's gonna have an army of like 400 men you know he's doing great you know he's doing well, great that, that's what i mean though it's it's like from esau's point of view he he's a he's more like possessions and and right now and yeah he's mad at his brother but what ha, what doesn't he have because of what yeah. you know he doesn't even look at the promise from god he yeah. looks at, oh, I've got everything I need here, so. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And look at what happened to Jacob. I mean, Esau's just going from success to sex, success here, glory to glory. And Jacob is just being put through the ringer. Yeah. And his sufferings haven't even begun. His greatest grief and sorrows are coming. Um, but right now, it's like, you know, he's just been abused for 20 years, uh, manipulated, you know, worked like a slave for 14 years. Uh, taken advantage of, um, but God's with him. But God is with him, and that's that's the big difference for for us as Christians. It's like, you know what? Yeah, it doesn't look like God loves us sometimes. If you judge by success and health and wealth and all that kind of things, it's God's presence, and that every trial is is for our good, shaping us and and for eternal glory. That's the the aim. Uh, whereas Present glory, that's the world. The world's gonna get that. So um it's it's really fascinating to to do a careful study of Jacob's life. And you study Jacob's life and you really will get an understanding of of suffering and God's use of it. Mm -hmm. He suffers every conceivable grief that you can have. Um, not just taken advantage of. We're gonna see he's about to be crippled. Um, he's going to lose his wife, he's gonna lose his son. And he's just going to suffer every conceivable grief. Um, but the Lord is with him through it all. And that's, uh, that's where we go from here. So let's pick it up, verses 6 to 8. Bob, you want to get that for us, Bob Thomas? Um, sure. eight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Okay. So the messengers return. And what do they say? That 
they they saw Esau and he's coming to meet him. Oh uh, yeah, Esau's coming with his entourage, four hundred men. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, that doesn't sound good. That no, no, not good. You know, I don't, I don't know. They don't say what his intent is. It just sounds horrifying. I mean, why does he need four hundred men to come see me? <laughs> I mean, what's up? If you remember, it was Abraham had three hundred eighteen men that mm. defeated armies. I mean, so they, these guys can do a lot of damage, and so uh, Jacob is greatly afraid. This is great because you, you see, this is and distressed about this. You know, he's. Jacob is making progress in his faith, but his faith is not perfected. Mm. Uh, he's still he's still a man. He's still he's still weak in many ways. And and how else? He doesn't say to himself, "Oh, I have nothing to fear. The Lord's going to be with me through this." It's like he's terrified. He sees the threat before him, and he is terrified. And so, what does he do uh, in his distress? Plans he are losing part of part of what he has, but making it so that he can at least save something. Yeah, he di he divides into two camps, um, thinking that at least, at least one camp will escape. Uh, the, that that's a theme already in this chapter is this two camps thing. We just saw he names that place up at the top here, Mahanaim, which means two camps, God's camp and and my camp, and now he's going to take his camp and divide it in two. Um, so we have this happen here. Um, let's pick it up. Verses 9 to 12. Um, let's see. Uh, Rob Roy, you want to get that for us? 9 to 12. Okay. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with hope, only my staff, I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But, he, but you said, I will surely do you good and make your offering as the sand of the sea, offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. This is a really big moment for Jacob. He is feeling the fear and the distress of the situation. And this is an act of pure faith at this point. What does he do when he feel he's feeling that fear and distress? And it's a, it's a legitimate one because Esau is coming with 400 men. The last he heard of Esau was, I'm going to kill this man. And now he's going to come meet him with 400 men. Mm -hmm. He turns to God. Yeah, yeah. Jacob prays, and I think I don't know. Is this the first prayer of Jacob? I don't even. It could be the first prayer, but this is. I'll tell you what is the definitely the first. This is the first time that Jacob refers to God as Lord, which is his formal name, Yahweh. So Jacob prays uh, to the Lord. For the first time, before, if you remember, back at Bethel, he had said, you know, if God, and then I, you know, I'm trying to think, remember what, what it was. Back in, uh, when he left home and he met the angel the first time, we, we saw him, let me find it real quick. Was it 28? Mm. Yeah, it was 28, I think it was. Yeah, that's his first encounter. And he he, make, he doesn't pray as he makes a vow. He makes a vow to God. If God will be with me, then I come to him again in my father's house, then the Lord shall be my God. Okay. Remember he said that. He made that vow back at Bethel. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And what's happening now is he is fulfilling that vow, in a sense. The, the Lord is now his God as he cries out to the Lord who's been with him through these whole things. And 
he notice how he prays. This is a great prayer. Yes. How does it begin? O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac. Yes. O oh Lord. So he addresses God. Okay. As the God of his fathers and his grandfather. And his great, yeah, the God of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And he also says what else in verse nine? He calls him Lord. Oh Lord. Yeah. Um, who said to me, return to your country, right? Yeah. Man and me, right? And promised to do me good. That's really big. That's a great way to start your prayers. You're beginning with addressing God and reminding yourself of his promises. You know, as he begins there, even before he gets to his distress, he's he's reminding, he's remembering the promise. You saw that with, with Moses did that too in Exodus when he intercedes for the people. You know, oh God, you brought us out of the land of Egypt. You brought us to this place. He rec recounts the deeds of the Lord. He recounts the promises. It's a really a great way to, to start your prayers. You're, you're not just praying to an unknown God out there who is just hoping you might hear you, who has no interest in you. You're, you're praying to the God who has promised you things, who has taken you as his own, who sent his only son for you, and has made promises that he works everything out for your good. You, you remi remember those promises and you recount them, just as Jacob does here. And then what did he say next? I'm not worthy. Yeah. He addresses himself in a sense. I'm not worthy. Not worthy of what? The steadfast love and all the faithfulness. Yeah. You've shown me. Even the least of all the love and faithfulness you've shown me. You know. And now again, he says again, now I've become two camps. I have enough. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. You, the, the dividing of the camps above shows sort of the size of his entourage that he's bringing down there, that he has two camps even, that he can divide them like that. He, So he sees God rem remembering the promises of God and then regarding himself here. He says, I am not worthy of even the least of all these things. He is not claim anything to deserve anything it's just you promise you've made promises here and that's what he says next well first he says after saying that i'm not worthy you're the one who promised to do good Let's put that in bold i am not worthy of that good but you promised it's, that's a great prayer it's like it's like the prayer of a kid who's been miserable you know all year but you promised to take us to disney world so we're going, right? Because you promised. Yeah, I know. I admit I've been miserable, awful, but you promised. That's what it's coming down to. You didn't say if I was good. You said we're going. You said we're going. You can't go back on that. <laughs> I know I've been bad, but you can't go back on that. Right? That's, that's the kind of thing you promised, oh God, and uh, claiming those. So what's the next part? Uh, verse 11 is the request. Please deliver me from my, the hands of my brother. Yeah, deliver me. From uh, deliver me from Esau. Um, and he acknowledges his fear, mm -hmm. or I fear him. And so there's no pretense with him. He is honest, expresses his concerns, expresses his where exactly where he is. He doesn't pretend to be brave. I fear him. Deliver me from this. And then. Verse 12. Back to the promises, but you said. You said. I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea. Exactly right. So he's like, he's remembering those promises. They're really coming to, to play now. Again, I will surely do you good. Um, he's he, This is the, the tension. It's like he knows the promise of God 
is I will make you like the sand sea, and that that requires that he he's his offspring are going to survive. They're not going to be killed. They can't be killed uh, by Esau at this time. However, he's still afraid. You know, he's still afraid. It's kind of like that phrase. You know, I I believe. Help my unbelief. It's like, yes, I believe the promises, but I'm scared. You know, yes, he believes, but he's scared. And he that's when you pray. And your your prayer uh, moves you into alignment with the promises of God. So that you are, you know the promises, but you're not feeling them. And so I know my head, but my heart is terrified. And then through prayer, we're kind of bring them in line again. You promised, and how many times he, this, this prayer begins and ends with those promises of God to him. Great prayer, and many of the psalms are like that too. Many of the psalms of David start that you know out of the depths I cry to you, O God, hear my prayer, and then it goes into but you have made promises. You have you have been with me. You've delivered me, and I will praise you again. It starts with that honest cry, uh, but always concludes with that promise of God. So well, let's see what happens next to him. Um, verses 13. Let me start a new page so we can see it all together. Second. Um, let's see. Um, Teresa, would you want to get that for us here? 13 down to 21. So he stayed there that night. And from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their calves, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he handed over to his servants. Every drove by itself, and he said to his servants, Pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the first, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, To whom do you belong? Where are you going? And who are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, They belong to your servant, Jacob. They are a present sent to my lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all those who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterwards I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him. And he himself stayed that night in the camp. Okay, great. All right. So that night, uh, from what he had with him, he sends a present. What what's the present he sends here? Uh, Christmas uh, morning uh, sent him everything. He took a present for his brother for his brother Esau. Okay. And as we go through the list here, what do we got? Two hundred female goats. All right. Yeah, we'll start with that. So he says, uh, what, uh, 200? Female goats. Female 20 goats. Males. 20 male goats. Male goats. 200 ewes. Ewes. 20 rams. 30 milking. 30 milking camels. And their calves. Calves. 40 cows, 10 bulls, holy cow. 10 bulls, uh, 20, 20 female donkeys, donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. Male donkeys. That's a lot. Some present, yes. Quite a present. Now, if that's a present, how much does he have? I know. You know, if that's just a present from him that he hands off to him. So he... His plan is, how is he going to deliver them to Esau? A little at a time. Yeah. His servants uh, will deliver these. Wave after wave, we'll call it, right? Uh, of these. And J Jacob will be in the back. 
and these will be sent ahead. And the idea is, why does he do it this way? Why does he send the presence at first, wave after wave of them? To try to, to, try appease, to, soften him. His to appease him. Yeah, to appease uh, his brother Esau. Every wave he sent had all of those animals in it? No, each each group was one wave. Like a wave of the goats and then a wave oh, of okay. the ewes and a wave of, of the... Thank you, animals. Bob. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine waves of these things here. Just to appease his brother Esau, um, and he calls himself, what are they to say when they arrive, when each group arrives? This is a gift from your servant Jacob. Um, yeah, basically, this is a present from your servant Jacob. Jacob. To my Lord Esau. Esau. And he is behind us. Okay. So that's to appease his brother Esau. Uh, perhaps he will accept me. You know. Um, so he's really seeking peace. Uh, with his brother. Okay. Let's see how that goes. Uh, Jack, you want to get the next uh, section here? Um, 30, let's see, 22 to 31, I guess it is. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was, was put out of joint as he wrestled him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with, with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it so that you ask my name? And and there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Penio, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penio, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew, sinew of a thigh that is on the hip socket, because he had touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Okay. All right. So Why the wrestling? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Let's get into that. So that same night, his uh, wives crossed the fort of the j -box. So let's come back up to here. Is uh, there's Penuel here? So he's coming from Mahanaim, and he's coming over here to Penuel. That's where this encounter is happening here. So Edom is coming up to meet him, and this is where they're meeting here. But Jacob is behind. He sends the the, the kids ahead as well, and he stays. Um, he arose, he took his two wives, two female servants, and 11 children across the port of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and he is alone. So Jacob uh, is alone now. And at the night, a man wrestles with him until the breaking of the day. Okay. Well, let's go through what happens. What happens in this encounter? Uh, well, he wrestles with a man, uh, with a being, let me put it that way. Yeah. A man. All we're told at this point is it's a man. Right. Um, so a man with an unknown man, with a, with a man. And then what happens? It seemed to be a draw. So the man tweaks his hip and puts it out. 
Yeah. Um, the man did not prevail. And so he, uh, he touches his hip socket and puts him out of joint. Okay. All right. And then what happens? It, Jacob asks for a blessing. Well, first he asks the names. Um, oh, did he ask before, that even, before that, the verse 26. He asked him to let him go because of the breaking uh, day. Yeah, let me go for the day has broken. Okay. And Jacob's response? I will not let you go until you bless me. Will not let you go unless you bless me. Okay. All right. And so the man says... 27. What is your name? What is your name? What is your name? And Jacob's response is? Jacob. Jacob, okay, good. And the man says? You shall no longer be called Jacob, no, Jacob but, but Israel. Israel. Yeah, your name shall be, uh, shall be Israel. And why Israel? What does Israel mean? Um... Is it uh, the people of God or chosen people? Or... No, the L is that is God, but Israel means something else. It's uh, it means uh, he who strives with God or wrestles with God. Hmm. Uh, he wrestles with God, and he calls him that because you have driven with God. and with men, and have prevailed. All right. Jacob then says, Tell me your name. I'll tell me your name. Okay. And the man says, Why is it uh, that you asked my name? And he yeah. blessed him there. And he blessed him. All right. Now, Jacob interprets this as Jacob, like he did back in Bethel. He calls the name. Peniel. What does Peniel mean? Well, there's L in it. So I know it has something to do with God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Peniel means the face of God. And he says, um, Jacob's final words, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been spared. Okay. All right. What does this all mean? Okay. So, Coming through this now, the man who is wrestling with Jacob, who is this man? Jesus. Yeah, it seems to be, uh, well, it is it's certainly God in the flesh we're dealing with, which is certainly, that's the thing for the Son of God. We've seen this before. Where have we seen God come in the flesh? In a physical form where God has appeared to a man in physical, undoubtedly physical form. Moses. Not yet. Moses in Exodus, but you're correct. Uh, but in, in Genesis so far. Uh, Melchizedek was a um, picture of some say a Christophany. He's a picture, but we don't, he's not said to be God. Uh, but there is a case where God clearly came in physical form. Do you remember what it was? Was it Enoch? Is it Um, it said that he walked with God. That could be taken. Noah walked with God, possibly. But I mean, the story itself makes it evident <clears throat> that this is God, and this is God in a physical form. You know the story. 
Adam and Eve. Oh, there's that too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was it the story with Abraham with Sarah when there were three men that approached Abraham and two of them later went on to lot to Sodom? That is correct. Remember, the two angels went on, and the Lord in physical form, because Abraham brought water for his feet, had had Sarah cook him a big feast, and um he he is clearly the Lord in physical form with him. Here we have the Lord in physical form. So that's an amazing thing in the Old Testament. There are times when God is visible in physical form and not just uh, the spirit in the sky. I think he is, it's an incredible scene. Here's one, Jacob interprets it that way, that he's wrestling. It's, it's how many times we're told this is a man. This is a man who's wrestling with him. He says it. How many times does it say the man saw a man wrestled with him. The man saw that. And then he says, um, he keeps going down, asked him, he blessed him. So we have a few times where he says, it's the man who did this with him. It's physical. He's wrestling with him. He's even in the weakness of a man that he is unable to, um, he is subdued in a sense. He's, he's unable to break free from Jacob. So he is these physical limitations of a man. There's everything fleshly and manly about him. And yet at the end, Jacob knows that this is no ordinary man. And it's not an angel. And there's a couple things that how he knows that. What the giveaway is when Jacob says, um, you shall no longer be, he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Who says that? You know, especially to someone that you have been wrestling with and you have seemed to be subdued who just wants to get away. And then you say, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. What's the what's the meaning of that? Well, somehow J Jacob knows this is the Lord. This is the Lord who's come to him. Somehow he knows this uh, because he's asking to bless him. And then when he says, what is your name? Um. If, if he was anyone other than the Lord, you know, you know, you know, the purpose of, of the name thing is what that's about. I know it, re it reveals uh, names in, in scripture, reveal the character of a person. Uh, yeah. The, the, the naming of someone, giving them a name shows authority over them. So authority over them. Them. And also, you know, it's a God who gives a name. Adam gives the name to all the animals shows the authority of him over them and the and asking someone's name is is a sense of controlling them so if you remember jesus when he commands the demons he says what is your name mm. and and they try to exert control over him i know who you are jesus nazareth son of the most high god it's it's a by naming something it's an exercise of control over it and so when jacob asks what is your name um, he says, he says, please, please tell me your name. There's a sense of, I want to know what's happening here of exerting some kind of control and he won't give him that, but he will bless him. Why do you ask me your name? But he does bless him there. But what do you, th why does, why do you think God comes in this way of wrestling with him like that? What's the whole deal with that? What's why, why come in such a violent way? Right. Well, yeah. You know, this is. I'm just trying to read between the lines here. He, you know, he's going to name Jacob Israel. Mm -hmm. And there's so many pictures in the scriptures about how Israel will behave towards God. Um, uh, you know, Israel was unfaithful. So you get um, them pictured as a, as a, as a, a whore, frankly, in one of the books, you know, Gomer. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and so, I don't know, it almost seems like Israel is going to be a nation that, wrestles with God for a long time and yet God was going to bless this nation. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a thought. I think that's exactly right. This is a, uh, God will often do that. We'll, we'll give a physical picture. Uh, he'll do that with his prophets. He will have them do things acting out in symbolic ways, uh, a greater truth. So there's this picture now of a man and God, a man who is God wrestling with Jacob, um, giving him great stress and trouble, 
And yet at the end, Jacob is blessed and he prevails in that way. That's been his life. His life so far has been that way. He has been striving and wrestling. And yet he is blessed. He has been uh, been dealing with, uh, remember, running for his life from his brother Esau. You cannot underestimate the terror of that, of mm -hmm. having to flee your family because your brother is determined to kill you. And then to go to a father-in-law who takes advantage of you and enslaves you, and you're completely vulnerable, the strivings that are there, the strivings even with his, his wives as he's dealing with that whole situation. Um, and there's more troubles to come. And yet he prevails because the Lord is with him. And that's going to be not just Jacob's new name of Israel, he who strives with, wrestles with God. That's going to be the story of Israel itself. Mm -hmm. That this is a nation that will then be brought into slavery for hundreds of years, but they will come out and they will prevail. And that's been sort of the history of, you know, what we are called as the church, as the true Israel, as the, as the fullness of God's people are those who strive with man and with God and prevail. That's our destiny. We, we, we've, we've signed up for this by following Christ. Um, the ultimate picture of one who strives with men and with God, who bears the, uh, the attacks and the affliction of men, but also the discipline and the, and the wrath of God poured upon him and prevails, who is crucified, dead, and buried, but rises again on the third day. That's our story. This is the story of all of God's people. This is a great scene because you can feel it. It's it's visceral, and, and, and he doesn't come out just neat and clean blessed. How does he come out of this? Crippled. Permanently injured. He's permanently injured from this. He is crippled now. So that he has to lean. So you can imagine now he's walking with a cane, always having to lean on something in order to make his way. Again, that's the picture of the Christian. We are we are a crippled people in this life, always having to lean upon God in our afflictions and our troubles and striving with men and everybody hates us and God puts us in a place where we have to lean upon him in every way and yet we prevail. And yet in the end, uh, we are blessed. That's our story. None of that happens to Esau. Esau has got the golden goose here he gets whatever he wants um and but that's our destiny that's the destiny of jacob the one god loves and that's that's our destiny too it's a great story in fact you know it's it's our destiny because what what happens notice what they say in verse um 32 about this story The, the, something will occur afterwards to remind them they won't eat. You know, yeah. The, uh... yeah, and they they change their diet. They 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 adjust their diet to remember this scene. This is mm -hmm. such an important moment for for the nation of Israel, it's a defining moment of who we are, so that we will not eat that particular part of the thigh to remember Jacob's hip. Um, and, and so Jacob's hip uh, is forever remembered. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just I'm amazed by the little reminders that God builds into subsequent lives after these encounters. You know, when they when when Joshua crosses the Jordan, they take the rocks out of the Jordan and they stack them there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of things like that. You know, there are, there are different monuments that are built, altars that are built, things to remind it of encounters with God. And here's one that's actually attached to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's it's a sign that you never forget this encounter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> If you want, you... Um, if you want further evidence that it's God, my study Bible um, directs us to Hosea twelve four. What does that say? Um, I'm going to start at twelve two. It says the Lord also brings a charge against Judah, and He will punish Jacob according to His ways, according to the deeds He will uh, recompense him. He took His brother by the heel in the womb and in his strength he struggled with God yes he struggled with the angel and prevailed he wept and sought favor from him he found him in Bethel and there he spoke to us mm. Mm. yeah it's a big part of that now would his Hosea would be way after this time though oh yeah 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 absolutely you yeah but that that that's surveying the whole history of Israel it's it's sort of 
personified in this moment, in this scene. It's what's such an important. So whenever you see events that are remembered, where God gives them a feast to remember it, or uh, a monument of some kind, pay close attention to those scenes. They are to be remembered, and they're defining moments for us. And this is a very it's a defining moment. This scene is a strange one. But when you really reflect upon it, it's powerful because that's that's been our our journey. It's encouraging too because, you know, as we go through our own struggles, uh, it can be very discouraging, and you can think that God has abandoned us. Uh, but in these moments, you remember, no, God is He's right there. He's wrestling with us right now. He's throwing our hip out, but He's right there with us as we go through it. And by His grace, you know, we prevail, and uh, we're blessed. So. Jack mentioned Hosea. That's. That's the story with Goma, where he's told to go marry a prostitute because she's like Israel. Yeah. And yeah. in the and in the final analysis, he'll he'll beckon her back, even though she's been disloyal to him. Exactly how God would act with the nation of Israel with that. Great word. Great word. So you know what right. was interesting? I came to my mind when you were asking about um where else in the in the Old Testament up to that point we'd seen God in the flesh, and it, I thought to my came to my mind was the only other time we talked about it was we saw it was Abraham, but also with Melchizedek, Melchizedek he's, it's a question of whether he was Christ in the flesh or not. But it's you know Jacob was a direct descendant of Abraham, so it's like those are the only that line is the only one that up to this point that anybody has seen God in the flesh. That he never appeared to other people prior to that when he had lots of other opportunities. In in the key phrases in the flesh, he does appear in dreams and visions to some mm -hmm. of them. But uh, you're right, in the flesh he comes. So yeah. All right, we're gonna stop here.